just going to do a small karakia to begin with, the prayer. Whakatau, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tunga. Kia mā kuna kuna ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai. E hi a kia ana, te atakura, e tio, e huka, e hauhu, tihei mauri ora. Ko wai au, ko tainui tawaka, ko tararua ngā pai maunga, ko otake me ohau ngā awa, ko te pau o tainui, ko tainui ngā marae, ko nga te raukawa, ko nga te tūkorehe, tainui waikato a hau, ko tapu mano a tati te hapu, e otaki e noho ana, ko Ayla o tuku mama, ko Peter Spinks tuku papa, ko Hani, ko Kinui ngā tama, Ricky. Ko takuta aroha Sphinx tuku ima no reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. So thank you so much for inviting me. Just uh, an acknowledgement to all those listening. Uh, the prayer was around ceasing the winds from the west, ceasing the winds from the south, letting the breeze flow over the lands and oceans, let the red-tipped dawn come with a sharpened ear, um, and that's what we have here in Aotearoa, New Zealand today, because it's the morning, <laughs> and a touch of frost and a promise of a glorious day, because it's coming into that winter time, and it's a little bit chilly here in New Zealand. Okay. So, you. And um, I am K2 Oladua, and I am joined by Kelsey Green, who is a person who holds everything together here at Proven Sustainable. Um, and we're interviewing Dr. Sphinx. Can I call you Aroha? Okay. And am I correct that Aroha means um, uh, empathy, love, compassion? Is yes, that correct? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, okay. And um, you you have um, attached to your name uh, Ngati Rokawa. Is that how you say that? Nati. Nati Rokawa. Nati Rokawa. And what does that mean? Oh, so that is uh, one of the tribes that I affiliate to. It's probably one of the uh, major tribes that I, well, major, I just mean that I have the most ancestral link to. Okay. <laughs> so we always um, acknowledge all our whakapapa, all our genealogy. Um, so there's links and marriages to different tribes along the way. And depending on where you are in the world or where you are in the country, you would acknowledge those ancestors from that particular place and link in and show that connection. Uh, so right now I'm sitting on Aotearoa land as well, so it's um, important to acknowledge this tribe um, and those sub-tribes. And yeah, so that's how we help to introduce and show that connection to where we are. So it's very, the, the ancestral lineage is very um, upfront, formalized in a way and very important to uh, the, is it Maori? Is that the correct pronunciation? Uh, Maori, so there's more of an A, Maori. So yeah, and we roll the R, so for Aroha. Yeah, <laughs> it's sort of may, maybe sounds like a bit of a Z to some, but rolling, so aro, Aroha and Maori. Maori. Okay, mm. well, the rolling of the R is a little bit difficult for my tongue, so <laughs> forgive me. Um, I want to begin uh, here with the familial communal um, formulation of family lineages uh, as, as it's practiced in, um, among the Maori. Um, how, how is that organization formed 
And what is the history of um, the people that are Maori? Very big question, but I'll try to be short and sharp and acknowledge as well that there are others with um, a lot more expertise in, in our mātauranga Māori and understandings. Um, but to speak um, as we do from knowledge that's been handed down to us, um, Fano and, you know, relationships and connections are very central to our understandings of the world and our perceptions. Uh, so Fano is around those close uh, family unit. Um, and then often we'll, we'll then describe uh, Fanoinga, our extended families, mm. um, to hapu. And hapu means to actually be pregnant um, and it's um, related families um, and then we'll also have those connections to the tribes and the iwi which actually comes from core iwi the meaning of your bones so again all related and coming from both the the tribe as well as sub tribes come from a, an amazing ancestor and it's an ancestor that connects all those within so you know if you reference the name like Ngāti Rokawa, that all those in Ngāti Rokawa, and there's tens of thousands of us, we're all related, and we'll all acknowledge that relationship and go, wow, you're connected. So that connection to each other, as well as the whole environment, is really, really important to us. We papa and have ancestral genealogy, which goes to all the parts of the natural world, including mm -hmm. yourself, uh, listening, um, as well as the, you know, Māori, deity, so Atua. So we'll also connect and have our whakapapa. And there are those with amazing knowledge that can just recite that <laughs> right back eons. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And um, the Māori came from across the Pacific, from throughout the Pacific, to New, New Zealand. Or what is yes, called the, the Māori waka did come from on numerous voyages on, on sailing ships, Wakahauro, um, from the Pacific, from Hawaii. Uh, they have different stories from different parts of Aotearoa uh, that will have different journeys and different stories of those journeys. And they'll also have visited different islands on the way to Aotearoa. There are also those tribes in Aotearoa in New Zealand, who also, uh, you know, speak of and have narratives of uh, ancestral linkages to those that were here before the Māori waka arrived as well. Um, and different parts of New Zealand will have those. Um, I, I, you know, and we're always learning, I'm always learning, um, as I get to do this amazing mahi for the environment, um, around some of those different stories. And, and even recently, my stepson, right in the bottom of the South Island, talked about finding, he also is working in the environment space and goes, wow, I saw these Vs in the language of some of the place names down there. And he thought, these are Māori names, but they've got a V. And he thought, they must be misspelt. <laughs> huh. And he was talking to the Komatua elders down there, um, and they said, no, we actually fuck a papa to the Marquis Islands. I was like, oh, wow, I haven't heard that. I've heard of Tonga, Rarotonga, Hawaii. Um, yeah, yeah, it's like amazing. Wow, it's so extensive. Uh, yes, Kelsey. I'm wondering if you can speak to your beliefs on the significance of language and how language is constructed or like used, um, the differences that you have observed between like the English language and your native tongue um, in, in relation to that connection of place and like your environmental advocacy and like efforts. Certainly. Um, so firstly, to acknowledge, you know, those in the United States and in the First Nations there, um, we also, you know, just breaching on what Ketu mentioned and then coming into your kōrero, Kelsey, we also, um, I've heard 
that had traditions of what we have wānanga, learning, and we, and we learned during winter times. So we did all our um, resource gathering and things like that during summer. And winter would be a time where we went into celebrating the Matariki and Pileides arriving, um, and we wānanga during the winter times, and we did education. Some say that um, parts of that education system for those that had gone through different levels, so there are different levels of learning. Um, there is some kōrero around actually at that higher level of learning. They were also sent on journeys to go through the Pacific, uh, back, back up throughout Asia and around the Americas too, um, to visit and explore and bring that knowledge um, back. To, to New Zealand. Um, so I guess just on the language of our kōrero, it is there's many of our people who all kōrero Māori fluently and my tamariki, my kids do, um, who will be able to kōrero and speak to those within the Pacific. Uh, so they'll have a slightly nuanced, uh, slightly different uh, sounding but able to converse so there's a lot of similarities in, in the words just the difference in how they're pronounced um, and that's within our tribes here in New Zealand as well. So I guess um, to, to mention very briefly we did have the uh, British and um, signed a treaty with them back in 1840 uh, and through those colonizing mechanisms did have our own language um, repressed, um, and my grandmother was one of those that was beaten as a five-year-old um, at school um, to not speak our traditional languages at school. Hence, didn't pass it on to my mother or to me, very much encouraged me into that English uh, education system to get ahead that way. However, there is the revitalization uh, happening you know, for the last few decades to bring that back uh, to our children. I guess language is a really pertinent part of, if you cut that off, you, you cut off those knowledge sharing opportunities, teaching the culture uh, and a lot of other understandings um, that go with it. So it was definitely a intentional tactic uh, to yeah, to assimilate us into that British way of life. Um, and I think we're certainly making head roads into healing that here in, in Aotearoa. Your work speaks a lot to healing. Um, and certainly language has a lot to do with healing. You mentioned um, the restoration of the language, the restoration of the culture. How is that going there? Um, and then how does that fit into the scientific um, ecosystem work that you are doing? Yeah. Well, I guess, like I mentioned, um, as a young child, my, my grandmother had pulled me aside um, she'd had a dream and she comes, my family come from on my Māori side, on my mother's side, uh, from healers, from tohunga, medicine people that uh, work in a spiritual realm um, as well as the physical. Um, and of course, we have a realm of Modi, of life force or chi. Um, so her dream as a child for me had been that she'd see me helping in this area of te tai ao, um, and environment. Uh, so that had been her dream that she'd mentioned to me uh, to get ahead in the Pākehā education system and that by doing so, I would help uh, the environment and I'd also help um, my family and cousins and and you know, tribe and things like that. So I think since the young lady had been placed on this path by her, uh, we all have our own choices though. So I made different choices to take different degrees and uh, to get myself to where I am. But my mother is a healer, practicing healer, um, and does a lot of prayers. Um, and so the work that I do around yeah, healing the environment. Uh, we know it's interconnected with healing people 
and those around us as well. We see um, that the devastation that came through with uh, taking out our forestry in the late 1880s, 1890s here in this area, um, as well as the agricultural sector uh, doing a lot of damage and those changes within landscape. So as a kid as well, when I was in Whangwata, living there with my grandparents and my mum, there was um, the sewage put in by the local authorities into the harbour and it just gave everybody stomach aches and things like that. So, and a lot of the Māori families, you know, love that kaimana, we love the seafood. <laughs> um, so I think seeing that and witnessing that, it, it's, yeah, gone through into the sort of like work that I do today to help reverse that and help revitalise that. Um, yeah, and it's very much one of our understandings that if we can do that for the environment and as well as the people and work with, um, yeah, all those around us, you know, we, as I mentioned, relate to not just Māori, non-Māori as well, all the citizens, and I think we bring those diverse knowledge systems together and it makes, you know, what I really enjoy the mahi that I do today. Okay. Um, uh, Kelsey, did you have a follow-up? I know you asked a question about language. Did you have a follow-up that you wanted to do before I go forward? Uh, um, with the language, I think just to specifically hone in on what you are starting to speak to or an observation listening to you as that with the way you introduced yourself and peoples embedded in your very naming structures and words are like implicit, like, or explicit ways of connecting to others and to earth and the environment. And my, my reflection in the English language, um, that is that connection in the, the words and the way we introduce ourselves is not included or as explicit. So I'm wondering again, then that translates to our worldviews and the ways in which we're thinking of how we relate to the environment if our language is not inclusive of that in such an integral way that yours is. So that's um, just a reflection or sharing out that I wanted to contribute and I can let K2 follow up with like your more targeted specific question about language as well. Yeah, I would agree with that and, and um, the naming, you know, places and locations being really, really important. And I think, you know, it is an expression of our worldviews and our perceptions of the world. Um, we see a way in which like Māori and, and likely other Indigenous and those that we've met and, and talked to around that connections and and with the environment that it's very much um you know a part of our relationships and therefore responsibilities um to look after it's like our grandmother <laughs> it's like um yeah all those different they're all parts of our family therefore we have that responsibility um to protect and we also know that they do so much for us so giving back, you know, we're so reliant on the way in which we live and survive, um, not only as a species, with all other species as well, um, and feel that responsibility to care and give back, really, reciprocate to them. The give and take, the give and take of nature, uh, the give and take with nature. The, the um, work that you are doing as an environmental scientist um, with fisheries and restoration ecology, um, it, that, that's, is that about synthesizing the Maori um, uh, worldview and way of being in the world with the Western approach to the world as object, how do you, how does how does that fit? How have you been able to negotiate that space? Yeah, fabulous question. <laughs> I guess in the in the roles that I've been lucky enough 
been fortunate enough to be involved in uh, for probably the last 15 years, it has been in that synthesizing and enjoying watching um, and observing and being part of collaborative teams that bring different expertise um, to, to projects and, and input. And I really enjoyed it. Um, we certainly have those within our communities, within our tribes, especially here in Ōtaki. I loved coming here 20 years ago and seeing the revitalisation that was occurring for our culture. So standing by a tūturi Māori, a really strong Māori point of view mm -hmm. um, and understandings. So, and it's fabulous to be alongside those. So I've got some of the aunties and uncles and cousins who, who uh, very much stand for uh, Māori knowledge to be uh, integral in itself. So to you know, because it is a knowledge system that's fantastic. It's worked here for hundreds of years. <laughs> Why change it? <laughs> so, so that's fabulous. Um, and the role that I play, um, I get to see them stand by that and allow them the freedom to express that um, and contribute it to other projects that have got, um, yeah, you know, Western scientists. Uh, Parker learning, uh, you know, yeah, so the oh, Parker, um, non Māori, you know, the education universities and things like that that are operating in a um, Western knowledge system. So the universities, um, councils, authorities, and central government and things like that, and their funding, um, and then wanting to also have. Um, similar outputs of a better environment, um, a better, um, you know, location, thriving environment, thriving communities. Um, so that's, yeah, one of the spaces that I, in which I operate with other cousins as well. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we call it the intertidal zone because it's sort of like in between the ocean. <laughs> so it's a bit of a, you know, you've got some wild weather coming in. Um, and sometimes we find it is that communication. Sometimes it is explaining, sometimes the scientific terms to um, my whanau and cousins and around what the terminology was that the, was just used <laughs> um, and vice versa, because you'll probably hear it in my conversation with you now, slipping in Māori terms now and again. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you don't understand that, you're know, like nodding away, thinking, yes, absolutely, and actually, you know, might be far apart from um, understanding what you're actually agreeing to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. The... Obvious question. Obvious question for me. What what does Western the Western perspective most misunderstand about the traditional Maori perspective and worldview? Do they really un? Is there really a grasp? that the people are part of the ecosystem as much as the uh, natural world is? Do they understand that? I think some do, yeah, here in, in New Zealand, um, but there's many that don't. And I, I think the biggest um, probably issue and therefore impact is a difference in values. So difference mm -hmm. in economic value being mm -hmm. number one priority <laughs> for mm -hmm. those that are not Māori at times, some of them, not everybody. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, with an economic um, system, there's um, power given to those that get to make changes on behalf of everybody, if it affects everybody. There's also that power of central government, um, and local government authorities that then get to exert certain power of what happens, who gets what. Um, and I think at the end of the day as well, uh, the more understandings we have, we've just made that change to teach 
uh, Māori within our school systems and within our education systems. So that's only been in the last couple of years. Um, and I think the flow on effect of that in the future will help with that um, understanding where we're coming from. It's actually also new that New Zealand history is actually going to be taught through our mainstream schools. So uh, we learn all about France and, and England <laughs> and the kings and queens and the wars and things overseas and not about the wars that actually occurred here and not about some of the atrocities and damages that occurred within our own country. But that will change in time. I think that grows awareness, grows understanding, um, and hopefully we have a better a future. It sounds like we need to bring you here to the United States so that you can help uh, some of the government officials here not do the work that they are doing to eliminate all of African American and African culture from the world view of the United States. But I, I won't go there. Um, the, the work that you were doing around the lake is, and I'm not going to try and pronounce it, I'm going to let you pronounce it for me. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the, the work that you were doing around Lake Wairumai, the, as I read it, there was some, uh, tension or some needing to bring the different people, um, different family groupings together. Was that, is that correct? Did I read that right? I don't think so. We just have numerous groupings, I guess, was probably explained um, yeah. within the thesis. The Sano had been wanting a restoration project for, for years. <laughs> so I was really lucky to, um, to sort of ask permission. We, we tunnel, have a tunnel process where I ask permission to support them. Uh, and their aspirations for the lake. It was more, I think, what I described was making it success, was bringing all the different groups to come in and support. However, um, what we do is really have, ask for and prioritise um, aspects of the project or contracts and things like that to be for the whānau first, and then we'll sort of reach out, get hapū, um, yeah, so the sub-tribes or tribal members or those that are married to us to have those contracts. <laughs> um, and then we'll extend to those of the community who have similar values to us. That's just the way in which we um, look when we're contracting in work or stuff like that. But um, I think it was just amazing. It just grew as a project and, you know, the families, they talked amongst themselves and, you know, they had family arriving from overseas that take them out to the restoration project to show them all the hard work, all the planting that they'd done. Um, and we also had all the learning institutions get on board. So we already had one from a um, science friend, uh, Rolly Rauditi, teaching science at one of the schools. Um, then the, another one heard, and then my kids were at another one, so we'd take out, and they got to do arts and sports and run and um, plant or plant groves of certain trees that were important to their particular school, that there was references within the name of the school. Um, and so it was really joyous to see. But we also had like the universities, two different universities bringing students out that did um, landscape architecture, architecture, and you know, um, watching them interact with our young kids. And, you know, yeah, it was just amazing. It was amazing to be part of. Um, but it was part of the success story, I okay. think, bringing okay. all those different organisations, different family members together. And uh, what is the status of that project now? Yes, we still have more to do uh, there, and I'm currently back um, working uh, for uh, one of our tribal organisations, Ngahapu Ōtaki. So it's um, one of the things I do this week or next week is around the planting again to continue out there. Um, we did open the stream um, and drain last year. 
we do have um, yeah, some of the cattle that was let back in at one point. So we had to get out there and pencil on off again and, and talk with the farmer who's related to us. Um, so it's an ongoing project. Um, and yeah, we'll be planting out there again this winter. Um, we, we've had other restoration projects and we do think that it takes a good 10 years for them to become a self-sustaining uh, area. We still have to get out there and, and have events where we as families are going out there and enjoying planting together and giving back uh, to Mother Earth and, and the other deity. Um, I was just on a recent one a few weeks ago, uh, Hini Itehuhi, which is goddess of uh, wetlands, um, and we you know, spoke about that, shared that with the community. Uh, there were other Māori speakers as well, and um, you know, I love it because at the end of it, we walked through a harakiki grove, which is the big flaxes, um, into a mara. Um, a garden for medicinal plants and we oh. planted there and I got to actually plant with my mother <laughs> oh, it's fabulous you know and they, they had the young baby um, yes yeah, so they had three plants getting planted to start the planting season that was a ceremony that was done by a rongwa medicinal um, collective yeah so it's fabulous to be part of. so yeah we'll be planting again soon you too and Kelsey <laughs> That is fabulous. That is fab just the, the way that um, you are describing the, the interaction of the families, the family groupings and the families specific is just heartening. Um, it, um, it touches me in a very deep place, in a very deep place. Um, the the work of the elders, can you talk a little bit about the work of the elders and the role of the elders in the community? Highly respected. You know, traditionally, um, we had, like I mentioned, our own wānanga and education systems. Um, and certainly uh, within my family, um, yeah, just there was a certain respect given, um, but it was also reciprocated to others as well. So definitely children were absolutely treasured. <laughs> There's a part in between where you meant to be learning. And, and um, yeah, so uh, I looked to them for guidance, um, those that are older than you. Um, and there are like what we call rangatira, um, leaders within that for different areas um, and so we were also looked at when we were young and seen for having different skills or potential in different areas um, and then you would be uh, supported to grow in that area so for example if I'm looking for somebody with the genealogical um, understandings there's certain you know I'm going to tell you that we know to go and talk to them um, and then if it was somebody for the environment, there might be others that would go and talk to uh, medicine, others. Um, and again, those who um, work in, with the authorities and have had those relationships and decades of working with the authorities on how do you go about this? How do you get funding for this? Or how do I negotiate in this space? There'd be um, others that would go to um, an auditor talk about their experiences or give you guidance going forward. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, your role, the way that you have been able to um, bring your knowledge and expertise to the service of the community and to your people, um, you're, you're interacting with people in colleges, with government um, uh, people as well. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And bringing that traditional, the traditional principles and values and that worldview to them, 
Um, what does that do for you personally? How does that express itself in your day-to-day -day living, in your day-to-day -day identity? Just find it really fulfilling. I enjoy, um, yeah, I enjoy meeting different people from different backgrounds and uh, yeah, I was probably, you know, you, you have me think on this, Kitty. <laughs> I, ever since I was little, I loved soaking up knowledge <laughs> and learning. Um, I used to, we laugh as a family how I set my younger brother assignments during holidays because, you know, we, we lived on a farm, so we ran around everything uh, to do with nature, but I also set us assignments. So I think I've just gone on through the academic system, but also just in my career to be learning, you know, from the different places in which, you know, I interact and work with. I acknowledge as well my my whakapapa in genealogy to English, Irish, Scottish, Welsh um, ancestors who came to New Zealand and, and certainly my Sphinx's side and Hamilton's side, um, that they're, you know, yeah, you know, we're all lovely people um, who are working in this space in particular, in the environment. Um, and, you know, we're all trying to do the very best. So getting to um, be in that space. And I guess sometimes, um, you know, I do fall back on the science and my science qualifications to understand some of that. Um, and even the policy and legislation and compliance stuff I've done, you know, fisheries law and things at university came through and did compliance um, and learnt within businesses as well from the seafood industry. So watching unsustainable practices that I wanted to see change. So standing up for those areas as well um, and being able to yeah, sort of like stand up sometimes and say, actually, we we need to do this. There's a certain urgency that's coming. Um, we sort of understand it's quite critical around the climate change impacts that are happening, the amount of pollution that's happening within our oceans and within our waterways, and how sick that's making um, our country. And there's those global effects going on as well. So I think... Um, I, I feel that there's a growing understanding that Indigenous peoples also through, you know, what Kelsey was talking about, our understandings of being related to the world, mm -hmm. having that, um, yeah, responsibility to look after it, that there's a, a critical time now and that we really want to be standing up and saying we're the generation that thought, hang on a minute, we need to change what we're doing. We actually need to to swift, you know, change and actually some of the ways in which um, we traditionally lived, um, yeah. you know, are, are actually ways that we should actually return to. So Papakainga, uh, places where we lived communally and had you know, our houses and had them off the grid, had them sustainable, um, you know, looking at the infrastructure, um, in vulnerable areas that are prone to flooding or prone to coastal erosion, things like that. We need to be planning in the future uh, of how we're going to adapt and move to that. So as a people, we adapted. You know, we came from the warm, mm -hmm. temperate areas. We came to a cold environment. Mm -hmm. There were all new trees, all new plants, all new species. Um, so we, and we moved. If there was a flooded area or there was a tsunami, we moved our traditional homes. We moved um, as a community. So part of what I'm doing now, uh, working in those areas, is having wānanga, having workshops with our people, um, and then being part of collaborative projects where we're also talking with the communities because from a Māori point of view, if you make those collective um, decisions and you um, engage with, with you know, those that you're representing to input into and help make those decisions, then it's empowering what we call mana enhancing um, that, you know, that people are aware and people get to choose. So if you want to still have 
um, your whare in a beautiful coastal place, but you know that the beach is coming in, well, is the options for you to put it on piles or poles? And, you know, can you elevate? Can you go up and, and move later? Or, you know, what options are there for you in the future? So I think, yeah, I just enjoy being in that space. It's not an easy space um, at times. Um, and, you know, acknowledge that and, and those who are in this area um, for their careers um, may find that at times. And I've worked, you know, in WWF New Zealand had an amazing team of scientists and, and worked with um, marketing teams and others as well, all to help the environment. And I would just talk to them around something that we do uh, when it times get tough, you know, we will jump in the ocean for a swim. We will hug a tree. I'm a tree hugger and proud. <laughs> we will talk to the beetle. <laughs> and we will, yeah, you know, talk with nature and share. And um, I guess, yeah, that's part of our own healing and mental health, well-being as well. Um, but I operate as well on a spiritual level. Mm. So I am a scientist who works a spiritual path um, and you know, acknowledgement to me and my cousins and Fano who work in the space as well that, um, you know, some get those messages from ancestors um, mm. to help guide us. Um, I'm always looking different insects or weather or uh, different plants doing different things will actually influence uh, what I'm about to say in the speech or what I'm about to write or do. Uh, so we take those cues from the environment as well. It's a long explanation. Sorry, I forgot what your question no, was. That was, but a beautiful, <laughs> that was a beautiful explanation. It was a beautiful explication. The, there are seven core concepts that, that we hold. Um, and they are sustainability, endurance, resilience, freedom, resistance, sovereignty, and reparation. Is there any one of those that you more identify with than another, than the others? Uh, in all honesty, Kitu, when I read those, I thought I can relate to all of them. <laughs> and they all speak highly to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's the honest <laughs> truth I thought oh wow is there going to be one here and, um... <laughs> but I thought they are all are really really amazing values I guess to pick one because otherwise I'd talk all next few days um, <laughs> would possibly be around um, the resilience I think I've talked a bit about that freedom um, and allowing our people to express their culture um, and knowledge systems and language within projects. Um, and I have a bit about that in my thesis. So really at the moment, it is around resilience, I think, as a country, what we're trying to build here. And I think what Aotearoa, New Zealand and Māori, uh, I guess, can give to encourage and inspire others in the world would be um, around that. So I think we... Um, as a nation, were um, collectively, um, you know, strong when COVID hit us. So as a nation, it doesn't matter what mm. Jacinda, um, as a prime minister, made and her, her, her um, you know, valuable um, advisors there in government, you know, as a nation, we locked down and we managed to keep COVID out for quite some time as a nation. Um, and I think it really showed just how strong we can be as a really small country, as collective. The amount of um, reaching out within communities and supporting the most vulnerable um, and, and just each other. I mean, we're all pretty vulnerable. It's a pretty scary time. But having come through that, um, I think it gives hope for us to also. Um, give back in this area of environmental sustainability to be able to know that we take as a species, we do, we utilise resources, we are, um, you know, as Māori acknowledging that, um, but to do it in a sustainable way, to do it in a place that we don't actually wreck 
the planet in which we live and that it thrives for the future um, is something that yeah, I'd really like to see us do as a nation and I think it'd be really fabulous. There's amazing work happening, not just um, here with Whakatapu Nga Rua Mano and the revitalization of our language and culture here and, and I know that I'm going to Kitu and, and lovely Kelsey will put a link to Tamana Morokwa um, and the Māori University here in Ōtaki and the work that our tribe is doing. But there are amazing stories all around Aotearoa, all around New Zealand for environmental um, restoration projects, revitalisation projects um, for our people as well. Um, you know, um, and there's it, amazing sports things that are happening there. You know, we've had the hacker and, and the rugby on stage in the global um, arena for a while now, but I'd really love to see that um, being promoted and sharing with the world. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, indo Indigenous knowledge is amazing, and it, they come from centuries of knowing so incorporating that within policies and plans and actioning it. It's all about action, which builds that resilience. <laughs> We've got to give back um, and see that occur. And I think Indigenous people leading those projects, I think, is a fabulous way to go. We've had science hasn't had all the solutions. Otherwise, it'd be a better place. We've had a lot of data, mm -hmm. a lot of research, a lot of funding placed into scientific information. We've got a lot of um, guidance from them already. Um, and I think it's still important to have that um, more as a supporting tool. If we could um, empower Indigenous people to be leading more projects, um, yeah, I think we'll be successful in making the world a better place in the future. No doubt. Are there um, connections that you have within other indigenous communities and other locations throughout the globe? Is that a, a part of your work or part of the work of the Maori community? Uh, so definitely have had. Um, I, mean, I still I guess I have a few connections um, and my role is the science director um, at the Worldwide Fund for Nature New Zealand. Uh, I was lucky to be part of the conservation director network um, and interact with more of people from all around the world. So mm -hmm. Worldwide Fund for Nature, the Panda logo is in over 100 countries. Um, so we'd meet every month, um, if not more, on different um, you know, subjects. So if it was the marine subjects or others. Um, but as conservation directors, we would also catch up. Okay. Um, there was part of helping Indigenous peoples and helping with the engagement with Indigenous peoples from different parts of the world. Uh, so I'd help to provide advice on that and end with, uh, the international conservation director in Switzerland as well would give me a call to ask me a little bit about that, um, knowing the work that I do with supporting um, yeah, Indigenous leaderships and mm -hmm. incorporating that knowledge within to work alongside science. Uh, I was part of the Oceania First Voices project and help establish that with an amazing guy um, and team over in Australia. Um, and that worked with, uh, and it was just starting before I was made redundant, um, with the Solomon Islands, Fiji, Australia. Um, one of the ladies that worked for me worked in with Fiji in Rotunda Islands, um, or Rotana Islands. I was just thinking, I have said, pronounced that wrong. <laughs> it's been a couple of years. Um, and then Bubba Cook worked throughout the whole Pacific, so the Americas was included in some of his work. Um, I guess it was part of the, um, we were part of the Asia Pacific region for Aotearoa, New Zealand, so we'd have certain projects that we'd talk to around migrating birds, um, migrating whales and, and projects like that. So it was, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, that was pretty extensive. But I also do with my mum, because she's a healer, so she um, also 
has um, a few uh, speaking opportunities um, with the Sufi order that she belongs to. Um, so now and again, we've had the opportunity to talk together yeah, with other indigenous, indigenous peoples from overseas. Wow. It's a pretty fantastic opportunity. That's, Love it. <laughs> that's, uh, you said your mom is a healer, right? And is there a an assembly of healers that work throughout the community? We, uh, I mentioned earlier, we do have a, a Rungwa collective um, here. Um, that's actually quite a relatively new uh, organisation <laughs> that is just representative and has. Um, been training and sharing. Uh, I think when I was younger, it was just certain people that you went to uh, that had the skills, and, and that still exists today. So we still have a lot of healers who are not part of that. Uh -huh. um, but that's a fabulous um, new entity. Uh, yeah, I think more traditionally, there are those like Tohunga uh, that will still go to the yeah, from my perspective and what I know, not usually sitting within any kind of guild or anything like that. They're usually, yeah, individuals that are really highly schooled in certain areas. There might be mm -hmm. um, a group of friends that will travel or do things together. Um, I know my mum's involved with the grandmothers of the Sacred We um, and have travelled overseas and it's more that they're um, yeah, like friends that will go and, and do um, corridor and help with retreats or things like that. But I think it's um, yeah, just knowing each other and more, which is our traditional way of just you know, talking and oral traditions. And we love something that we call um, kanohi kit kanohi, face to face. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we love that um, yeah, opportunity and, and we're in modern times now so our face-to-face -face here on Zoom, <laughs> get to meet and enjoy and kōrero, share knowledge with people from other parts of the world yeah, amazing Kelsey uh, is there any questions that you would like to follow up with? Aloha, you were mentioning really part of your fulfillment and speaking to matters you recognize are more urgent um, when it comes to protecting the environment or taking different changes. So I just wanted to, like, as we're getting towards the end of this conversation, give you the space to specifically name if there are particular focuses you are addressing or want our listeners to deeply consider as the most urgent matters to consider or to, to think more seriously about. I think at the moment, like I've been an independent consultant now for a year and I've done this before in other areas, um, but working with the you know, local iwi and local tribes um, and also being involved in a Tiriti or Waitangi treaty research project for those tribes in the northern Bay of Plenty area um, where we're also researching like the past. So it's learning from those past um, histories um, and using and having that opportunity for capacity building within our tribes moving forward. Um, having those opportunities come for funding to, to support that level of work um, and working collaboratively within projects is something that you know I hope to see and hope to grow within the work that I'm doing. Um, I'm seeing with certain um, authorities and the ones that I'm lucky enough to work with 
uh, in the Greater Wellington Regional Council and Kapiti Coast District Council, a willingness to to incorporate Mataranga Māori into what they're doing to be alongside science and other things. Um, but I think the most priority is around um, that action. So seeing the implementation of policies and plans, um, building our communities to be part of those solutions. I'm focusing currently in the area of um, fresh water. So we've got some one to why um, occurring. Um, so working collectively on, yeah, uh, sort of limits and plans and implementation actions within the region, having science and cultural indicators uh, to be part of that, to show their success. So um, I think that's important moving forward. So allowing um, iwi and other Indigenous people the freedom to express their culture, um, acknowledge their values and include them, um, and having some seriously large regional projects make a difference and show that it makes a difference and that not only can we heal the environment but we heal the people as well because we've got um you know health issues mental health issues we're like i mentioned covid recovering from that so how can we be uh knowing that we've got big climate change global climate change effects going on as well and have that opportunity to give back to the environment uh, you know, there's nothing better, I think, than going to those restoration projects and, and, and feeling, you know, feeling these trees that are years old now um, and watching the um, bird life come back. Um, and we know by putting the native New Zealand species back into the um, land and, and the ecosystems, we've got over 4,000 threatened species in New Zealand, over half of those are actually only found in New Zealand. So we're 2,000 species that will just go extinct if we don't turn things around. But if we can all be part of that solution, there's a, a growing um, concern with our younger generations around these climate change impacts. Um, so how do we help them be part of that solution? How do we give them hope for the future? How can we say there is going to be a better planet on which to to live and be, um, you know, and part of that is potentially reducing how we're using resources and, and you know, energy and, you know, growing rubbish. You know, can we pick it up? Can we be part of showing and be part of that example, show, lead by example? Um, and all the work that we do um, is you know, for the future generations, is for the younger ones is for our grandchildren's grandchildren. So we do like to look that far out, but we've got to hold ourselves accountable to what we're doing. You know, what can we do within the years that we've got left on this planet to, to make a difference? So, yeah. The, um, I think I have just one more question and it's about land management. Um, how how is land management working uh, in terms of the restoration projects? Is the what is the separation between traditional government or established government and the Maori communities? Is have they come together? How is that working? Well, they certainly haven't come together as yet. <laughs> <laughs> we, we'd love to see it, and, and certainly um, those in Otaki um, have um, promoted, you know, that as Māori, um, it would be wonderful to see the day where the Treaty of Waitangi was, which was, in my perspective, and, and I think others, uh, meant to be a partnership in which we... Um, and, and 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 not there was a rangatira tanga of us standing up and actually being our, our sovereignty of ourselves. So it was reinterpreted later into English, uh, which led to a decline of many things. Um, but there was also an aspect of we maintained our traditions and we 
maintain our ancestral lands and our tanga and our forestry and that which we all highly value. Um, and we know for a fact that if we'd maintained that governance within our country, our environment wouldn't be in the um, state that it's in. Um, so we'd love to see it come back. We um, you know, have a lot of agriculture. So one of the other projects, although I'm also, you know, so freshwater climate change is, is an area that I'm putting myself into and supporting right now, but also looking at regenerative practices is something that we're you know, passionate about. Uh, food sovereignty, um, planting traditional medicinal plants, but also having, you know, fruit trees and vegetable gardens so we can sustain our communities in the future. We've got climate change predictions happening, how are we going to secure that? Where are our seed banks? Um, and yeah, how can we diversify um, yeah, our practices? You know, we've, we've been a large farming country um, and it's devastated waterways. It's also impacted on biodiversity. We have drained wetlands um, and yeah, you know, those are all going to come back historically, those areas that were wet, uh, coming back with the amount of rain and things that we know we're getting and that we're going to get in the future. So, um, we are working hard. I think there are many uh, Māori communities around Aotearoa working really hard with uh, the local authorities, councils and that to change the way in which we're operating. Long way to go. Okay. Resilient, <laughs> sustainable. Yes. Thank you so very much, Aroha, for this uh, conversation. It has been wonderful. It has been enlightening. And uh, Kelsey? No, I echo your same sentiments as been an incredible balance of personal sharing, collective wisdom, and scientific uh, insights uh, throughout your region and global applications. So extremely grateful for all of this and want to, similar to as you brought us into this conversation, give you the opportunity also to end in a way that is in alignment with you, your peoples in the land. Thank you so much, Mickey, to the three of you. Um, and those others of sustainable, um, proven sustainability, just acknowledging the work that you do and all those that you've collectively um, interviewed and, and um, included and those that you will um, include in the future as well. Uh, mahi to all those listening who um, are working in the space or being inspired in this area, uh, kia kaha be strong. Um, I'd just like to quickly acknowledge uh, those that I've worked with in the past and the ancestors um, that have shared knowledge with me. Um, it's been an honour to represent them um, and those are my science colleagues and others and those and authorities that I've worked with um, acknowledging you know the sharing of knowledge with them and the passion that they will bring into this space. Um, yeah, kia ora to you all. I will just um, end with a, a little karakia and a mahi to uh, my real teacher, um, Pirapi, uh, for sharing this um, like quick, small karakia that acknowledges um, the beginning of creation, uh, this earth mother, sky father, um, and the, you know, it acknowledges um, people and that we have a, a finite short time on this earth, <laughs> whereas the Atua and deities live on um, forever. So, kia ora. Ko te kupu te kupu, ko te atua te atua, ko rangi nui ki runga, ko papa tonuku ki raro, ko mate ai te tangata, ka po, ka ao, ka awatia, mauri ora.